So tonight's first speaker is Dr. Wynn. He received his medical degree from Rosalind Franklin University of Sciences and Medicine in North Chicago and completed his general surgery at New York Hospital of Queens uh, Weill Cornell Medical Center in Flushing. He then went on to complete his cardiothoracic surgery fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center where he also completed his minimally invasive thoracic surgery fellowship. And we are proud to have him uh, join our staff at Monmouth Medical Center recently, and he's been a great addition and great help for us in managing our thoracic patients, both in uh, general thoracics and minimally invasive surgery. So bring a warm welcome, Dr. Wynn, uh, to tonight's first speaker. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for uh, allowing me to be here. Uh, I think it's a, a great opportunity to bring lung cancer awareness to the community. Um, I'm going to start out. So the talk, I mean, it's uh, we're going to talk about uh, my talk specifically is going to about uh, lung cancer, the the uh, the risks of uh, lung cancer with smoking, and we'll talk about smoking cessation. We'll talk about lung screening. And then I'll touch upon uh, a little bit of, about the surgical aspect of the treatment. Dr. Cohen will, uh, will talk more about the non-surgical treatment and the other modalities involved, okay? So I have no financial disclosures. So the, 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 the formal recognition of lung cancer as a primary lung cancer really started in the, in the turn of the early 1900s, uh, 1912 specifically from, from this uh, this article where they looked at uh, about 374 cases worldwide and they, uh, you know, in their, in their consensus that at that time, lung cancer is considered a, a rare form of disease, so there is not that common at that time. But things have changed. Uh, as you can see here in males and females, lung cancer is the second most common uh, in males next to prostate, and in women uh, next to breast cancer. Uh, about roughly 240,000 are diagnosed each year. However, despite it being less common, uh, in the United States that is, in the world it is the most common cancer. However, if you can see here, the, these are two slides. The above one is for the male patients the death rate associated with these respective cancer, that red line that's peaking there, that's the lung cancer. And on the bottom, so since the 1950s, men, uh, the mortality associated with lung cancer uh, outgrow all the other cancers since the 50s. In women, it's about the 1990s where lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death. Um, you know, like it's, lung cancer kills more people than breast, prostate and colorectal cancers combined. Um, so it is, it is, you know, something to, to, to consider. Um, so as, you know, in your lifetime, one out of 13 or one out of 16 uh, uh, patients could develop cancer, whether or not, this is a sort of a catch-all, whether you're a smoker or non-smoker, but roughly uh, about one to, one to 13 or one to 16, uh, you can get it get cancer. Uh, so, you know, what, are, what, what is the reason why, you know, cancer death rates and you know, incidents have risen? That's multifactorial, but uh, it's safe to say that it's most likely and it's directly related to uh, smoking. Uh, there's other factors that we, we can go into, but uh, specifically smoking is the main issue. Why? Because as a society, years ago, cigarettes is considered like any consumer products, right? We, we don't associate it with anything that's concerning to our health. It's just another product that we use. So you can see here, your physician, I mean, you, you would never see this today, but your physician is smoking, and you even have Santa Claus smoking. So it's kind of hard not to smoke, right? If you're a doctor and your Santa Claus is smoking, it's, you know, everybody can see why. I mean, even worse, you have a, an expected mother, a picture of an expected mother and a baby associated with cigarettes. You won't see that today, but you can see where we were before in terms of what cigarettes is to us as a society. Um, so starting in the 1950s when we start to have a sort of an inclination that this may be, you know, lung cancer may be uh, related to smoking. Um, 
And you know, even then they thought it was maybe circumstantial, but obviously you know, there's more to that. And the British Journal, uh, also in the 1950s, looked at a series of lung cancer patients and looked at which one are smokers and non-smokers. Clearly, for instance, the men, out of 649, 647 were smokers, and only two were non-smokers. So it's hard to, to ignore that, um, that statistics. You can see here, and, and you know, likewise, there's a discrepancy in women as well, maybe not as dramatic, but you can see that there. Um, and some additional study, you can see here that uh, you know, the dark bars are uh, you know, long-term smokers. And you can see, compared to other cancer, respiratory disease, uh, coronary disease, uh, and other causes of death, smoking has the most impact in lung cancer. Um, and so not until 1967 when, the, when we officially make a declaration as a, uh, in the United States that, you know, that smoking is, is harmful to us. Um, again, 70% increase in age correlated mortality. It's associated with uh, lung disease, heart disease, and you can have an up to a 20% fold increase in uh, 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 lung cancer. Fortunately, the trend uh, since then have been decreasing. Uh, this is 1955 to 1997. Uh, uh, overall, both men and women are decreasing. And this slide, uh, you can see that overall, it has been less. So currently, I would say roughly 20% you know, are still smoking. There is a, that blue or purple uh, part of the graph were the students. Um, there was a spike in the late, uh, in the late 90s. But since then, with increasing education, public awareness, I think overall it has been trending down. I mean, these are now the pictures that you see uh, as an anti-smoking campaign that we are looking at. Um, uh, you know, this is very graphic, but you can see where they're trying to hit home that secondhand smokers, as this child in this picture, can be detrimental. And the other two are very graphic pictures. Um, it even attacks our vanity, uh, you know, uh, about smoking. And it's, there's no denying it. Smoking will kill you, whether it's lung cancer or associated with other, other diseases. Um, 440,000 Americans each year, um, you know, die from diseases associated with smoking, uh, not just cancer. And 90% of them started very young. And in the worldwide incidences, it's not just a, a, a problem here in the States. Uh, in more developed countries like North America, in, in European countries, uh, even China, uh, there's a still a high incidence of smoking. But smoking comes in different forms. You know, it's not just cigarettes. You know, a, lot of time, a lot of times I get asked, oh, is marijuana can cause cancer? How about tobacco? You know, how about cigars? Or in the new trend now is uh, uh, electronic cigarettes or vaping, uh, so especially in the young patient population. Um, all of these potentially can have association with cancer. The, the vaping, that's so new that we don't have enough information about, but eventually it will come out. And so far, there's some data suggests that it is harmful to your health. Um, but again, it's only been around a few years, so you know, we have to wait and see. But again, there's other forms of a secondhand smoking. I think also, what, what is our, what's some of the chemicals are in th these cigarettes? So every time you burn them, that's seven, about 7,000 chemicals that gets released. Uh, about 70 of them are known carcinogens. Um, you can see the list here. These are chemicals that you find in things that you don't, where you never want to be in your body, but unfortunately when you burn them, it gets inhaled and it goes into your, your system. Uh, you know, what are some benefits, right? So if you, it, it's, the benefit is immediate. Um, you know, within minutes, your heart rate is improved. Within hours, your carbon monoxide level goes down. Uh, weeks to months, you can have your heart attack risk um, start to, to drop. Uh, if you move on, you know, within a m few months, you can have your coughness and shortness of breath uh, improve. Uh, at, at one year, your added risk of coronary disease is uh, half of that compared to a smoker. So, it, 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 you know, and if you go further down, by 50 years, you essentially, you know, have almost the same risk as a non-smoker. Uh, I think both in heart disease 
and I think to some degree uh, your risk of, of developing uh, lung cancer, but uh, mostly in heart disease. So how do you quit? Uh, there are a lot of uh, resources that, 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 that we have for you to, to, to utilize to help you uh, uh, quit. Um, a lot of considerations clearly is health is an obvious thing. It's cost associated with you smoking. Uh, cigarettes in New York is a $12 a, a carton if you're, or a, a, a pack of cigarettes. If you smoke a pack a day for 30 days, you're looking at almost $4,000 worth of, uh, of cigarettes that you're spending on. And you know, it affects family, lifestyle, conveniences. And there's, you know, you can talk to your primary care physician, any physician that you're, you're seeing that can help guide you and kind of move you forward toward uh, a way to quit smoking. There's, there's public information that's free access for everybody, like American Lung Association. But importantly, you have to have a plan, you have to set a date. <coughs> you want to have some support, social status. You know, if you have a partner that smokes, it's hard to quit when, you know, the person next to you is also smoking. So you want to have some family support and deal with some of the, the discomfort of, of quitting smoking. There are medications that we can prescribe to kind of alleviate some of the discomfort during, during uh, your stages of um, uh, smoking cessation. Uh, how, so how do, how do you know if you have cancer from symptoms? Uh, a lot of times you don't. Uh, especially if the cancer is early, you may not have any symptoms. Uh, unfortunately, when you do have symptoms, oftentimes is the it's, you know, cancer is very advanced. So you can have anything from coughing or you can cough up blood, uh, you know, shortness of breath, wheezing, you can have chest pain, uh, you may have an unexpected uh, unplanned weight loss. So how do you diagnose? Uh, usually it starts out with a chest x-ray. Uh, I mean, the obvious lesions, you can see it on the x-ray here on, on, the, on the right side of the lung, on the screen here actually, on the left lung. But a lot of times it requires a CT scan to, to really look at the details of the cancer. And it, it looks, it has a variation in how it looks. There's no definite look to a cancer. It can vary from what we call a ground glass opacity, which you can see up here. It's very, very light, faint. Or it could be as obvious as that, that third picture there, where it's very solid. Um, but we cannot base on just images alone. So we have ways where we obtain what's called a tissue diagnosis. Uh, we can do it through a needle from the outside with local anesthetic, we call it CT guided biopsy. Or we can perform a bronchoscopy and biopsy it through the, uh, bron uh, the, the bronchoscope. On occasion, uh, when the diagnosis is difficult with these modalities, less invasive modalities, we sometimes have to surgically do the biopsy, uh, especially if we think the, our suspicion is especially really high. Sometimes we can forego these biopsies and just uh, take it out. But usually it involves tissue diagnosis. And the second part of the workup is staging. Uh, usually it involves getting a PET scan, which is head to toe, what they look for if there's any metastatic disease. Uh, we have other um, surgical procedure that helps to diagnose the lymph nodes in your chest, which is part of the staging. Uh, we can do it through an endobronchial ultrasound or through a surgical procedure called mediastinoscopy. Um, so there are different types of lung cancer. Uh, usually they're broken into two major groups, either small cell or non-small cell. Uh, small cell, unfortunately, is the, more, the most aggressive of the bunch. Um, usually by the time you diagnose with small cell, a lot of times it's very advanced. Uh, fortunately, though, it's only 15%. But the, the rest of them, they have subcategories called adenocarcinoma, which is the most common of, the, of all the, the cancers. Uh, it's about 40%. And the, the next most common is squamous cell, and there's some other cancers as well. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a very busy slide, but uh, you know, how do we stage? What do we look for? Uh, so one of the things that we look for is the size of the, 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 the cancer or the tumor or the mass, and also where it's located. Uh, is it involving your chest wall? It, does it involve various structures inside your chest? Uh, how close is it to the airway? So we look at these things to kind of assess what we call the T stage. And then the second thing that we look for is called the, uh, the end uh, uh, stage, which is the lymph nodes involved. So throughout our chest, uh, in our lungs, and the mid portion of our chest, the mediastinum, there are various lymph nodes here. And so depending on which lymph nodes are involved, it dictates uh, your treatment strategy. Um, but this is just a picture of what, where all the potential lymph nodes you can see in your chest. And so when we combine these two things, 
we create a you know a staging process. Okay, the T here you see on the on the left, and up there is the N. So when you put them together, there are various stages. So what's the purpose of the stage? It it predicts your uh, survivability when you have the diagnosis. So we generally kind of reference it to a five-year survival. Um, the light green color there is stage one. It, it's the most recent uh, staging criteria that we, we have is broken down to three, but you can see that with stage one, your five-year survival is varies from about 77 to about 90 to 92 percent. So that's very favorable in stage one. But as you, can, as you progress down stage two, stage three, you can see the, it drops precipitously there. Um, so, you know, what's the, 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 how, so you can see here compared to breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer, the majority of bronchus, uh, lung and bronchial cancer, it's diagnosed when it's that very advanced, I mean, with distant metastasis. As compared to the other ones, not so much. So how do we go about changing that, uh, that, uh, that percentage where we can, f we discover them more localized earlier treating it earlier and, and potentially offering patients a improved survival. And that's, uh, as of now, that's screening. So we screen the patients. I think that we can catch it early. So how do we screen? There are different imaging modalities that we can use. X-ray is one of them. Uh, and the other one is CT scan. So years ago, actually not too long ago, even as early as 2000, about a, a 10 years ago, there was no, there was not enough evidence and a lot of the, you know, society, like American Cancer Society, uh, National Cancer Institute, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, they all say there's not enough data. We don't recommend routine screening for, for patients. So that was how we thought then. But in the last few years, we have a, a strong evidence from this particular study, the National Lung Screening Trial, where they, we find that there is benefit. So we, they looked at about 53,000 smokers and falling at the age of 55 to about 74. Uh, if you smoke about 30 packs or more or quit within 15 years, so they randomized them to get annual CT scans versus getting a chest X-ray. Um, and they follow up about five years. Uh, they discovered obviously more cancer on the CT scan because uh, I think it's a better study you can see there and 63 are diagnosed in stage one, while the x-ray, uh, about 48 is diagnosed in stage one. So what does that mean for us? There is a 20% reduction in, mort in, in uh, mortality um, associated by using CT scan over a chest x-ray. So that was the key finding that really prompted this lung screening process. So it became official, uh, CT scan, is, uh, can cut death rates in cancer. So what are some challenges? Well, why has there been such a hesitation with lung screening? Obviously, there could be a, a certain rate of faults, um, you know, positive, right? Then if you find it, but what if it's not cancer, or you're subjecting patients to further invasive procedure with it, uh, what, you know, is there, uh, you know, radiation exposure, which we will talk about briefly, and the cost to society? Um, to cover these screenings. So we, we do have what's called lung rats where I won't go into much detail, but we stratify what we find and then we can tailor whether or not we should just follow with further imaging or actually perform an invasive procedure. We don't just routinely uh, do an invasive procedure on everybody that we find uh, a lung mass on, on CT scan. And in terms of the radiation exposure, a low dose, so what we, the lung screening process now, we use a low dose CT scan, which is, you know, uh, one tenth of a exposure you would get from getting a CT abdomen. Uh, it's a little bit more than getting a mammogram. Um, so, you know, the concern about radiation, uh, I think it's not so much now with the low dose CT scan. But they, one of the main important factors is who's going to pay for this, you know. Uh, Prior to 2015, very little. Uh, most of the insurance companies weren't paying for it. CMS was not paying for it. But um, since then, essentially, everybody's covering for it. Uh, I, I can't even think on top of my head which insurance company would not pay for it, especially if Medicaid and Medicare is, is covering for this lung screening. Um, and so what are the, what are, what are the patient uh, criteria that you were looking at? Um, the recommendation by the National Cancer uh, 
uh, guideline is, is roughly about 55 to 74 years old. You smoke greater than 30 years. You stop smoking within 50 years. And, uh, and that's essentially all that you need. If you fit that criteria, you, you can get a, a, a CT, sc uh, CT scan for screening. And we do uh, have, with our Robert Wood Health System, especially at Monmouth, we do have a lung screening program. And we do have flyers and, and um, printouts out there in the front where you can contact us and we'll help you set up to get that CT screening for yourself. If you know somebody, a loved one that fit that criteria, it's, it might be a good thing to, to encourage them to, to get screening, okay, or yourself. Um, you know, smoking is not, I mean, you know, not the only reason why we have cancer. There are other reasons. Um, uh, you know, that's, I don't think we have enough time to go into everything, but viral factors, smoking, even burning of coal, um, cooking vapors, uh, genetic factors, radon. There's a lot of things that can influence um, cancer. And, you know, Dr. Cohen will talk about, you know, the bio biologic aspect of our cancer. Uh, not every cancer are the same. Uh, they, we're starting to learn that some of them produce different biomarkers. But we, I'll, I'll, go th I'll skip through these slides. I think Dr. Cohen will go in, into more detail with these. So let, let's move forward to the surgical aspect of, of cancer. So when we, we, we consider removing the cancer, obviously once the diagnosis is made, the, the, the staging is, is, is completed, now we decide on surgery. If once you're a candidate for surgery, we then assess, is your lung function adequate for surgery? Uh, we have different ways and different portions of the lung that we can remove. If you have adequate lung, the standard of care is to remove a lobe of, of your lung. So on the right side, you have three lobes. On the left side, you have two. So normally, if, if you have good lung function, the, the standard of care is removing that lobe that you see here on the low, uh, lower left. But sometimes, some patients may not have good lung function, so we, we remove less if we could to preserve as much lung as we can. So it could be anywhere from a little wedge to a segment, to a lobe. Sometimes the cancer is so advanced that we have to remove a whole side of your lung. Um, so this is just a quick sort of cartoon of what we can offer now. Uh, I think historically, um, you would require an open thoracotomy. In fact, I think a lot of the surgery done across the country is still done with the open thoracotomy. But there, you know, there, uh, with a tr trained surgeon, you can do it with minimal invasive. Uh, approaches. Uh, what are some advantages? Obviously, smaller scars, um, you can have fewer complications, less pain. Uh, it's been shown to sh uh, have shorter length of stay. Uh, and uh, to some studies show that it's actually more cost effective, especially if you're staying less at the hospital and get discharged early. Uh, so this is just a, a quick video. I want to show you what robotics is. I didn't want to show a very graphic picture of actually what I do. <laughs> Some of you might not like that very much. But this is a, a sort of a very safe picture to show to demonstrate what we do here at Robert Wood and Barnabas Health. Uh, so this is the new XI platform that we, we're using now. So this is all the articulations that the robot has. And this is the, the robot itself that we can move into the patient. And this is the you know, part of the elbow, and this is where we connect some of the instruments. And this is just the movement of the robot itself during the setup. This is the console that the surgeon sits on. It's not a, you know, press surgery and it does automatically actually control the robot itself. So this is part of the process that we go through. And this is a, a surgeon on the console doing the operation. And so that control gives you full articulation of your wrist. And so it mimics as if you're doing uh, you know, surgery with your own hands. So these are some of the instruments that we put into your chest. And this is just them sewing, you know, you can really sew a grape or you know, suture things together very finely. So, and this, uh, this machine is able to rotate you know, without you know, moving the patient. You know, the, ro the robot will move instead of the patient. So that's, that's uh, a huge convenience for, uh, for us during the surgery. Yeah, you, you can guide it, the, the, the assistant guides the robot arm. There's a, there's a laser that they use to kind of guide the, the, the machine over the patient. And you insert the, the instruments. These are small eight millimeter instruments that goes into the chest. So 
you have a bedside assist that kind of helps you, you know, uh, insert and remove instruments for you. And usually the robot arms, there's about four arms that we use that we put into your chest. So it's, you also actually have, and this is a, you know, a result of, of minimal invasive versus an open door economy. This patient to the right is, is one of my patients. The one to the left is, is not mine, a picture I grabbed from, the, um, from another source, but you can see the potential difference. Uh, and you don't have to do, I mean, on some occasions we do have to do open because the cancer is just so large or so advanced that we have to open. But usually when we can, the preference is that. I mean, it's the picture is worth a thousand words in this case, I would say. And now to conclude, we talked about you know, the importance of smoking cessation. Uh, and we do have uh, now a, a way to screen lungs as you, know, you previously had ways to, you have ways to screen for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, and other cancers. We now have a CT scan process. And we, we do have robotic surgery for, for the surgical aspect of treatment for uh, lung cancer. And uh, the, uh, you know, the lung cancer is a multimodality approach. It's not just surgery. We have radiation oncologists. We have medical oncologists, Dr. Cohen. Um, that we work together to kind of formulate the best treatment protocol for the patient. Sometimes it's just surgery, sometimes a combination of chemotherapy, there's immunotherapy, various other target therapy, surgery, and plus or minus radiation. So uh, with that, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to speak today. And uh, I will introduce. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, a, co a colleague, Dr. Cohen, who uh, is a uh, our medical oncologist. Uh, he served as an attending um, at the press breast cancer at Monmouth Medical Center. Uh, he's uh, one of the principal investigators for numerous numerous uh, uh, clinical trials. Uh, he's uh, fellowship trained in the oncology uh, with, uh, with a subspecialty in pain and palliative care and his practice is, is uh, with the Monmouth uh, Hematology and Oncology, Oncology Associates since 2004, and he's a great friend. I'm gonna be speaking about lung cancer in general, and then I'm actually gonna break it down to two parts of the talk. The first part of the talk will be primarily spe speaking of the oncological drugs that we use. And I, I have only one slide about immunotherapy, but I want to dwell on that for quite some time. And then I'm going to talk about the impact of lung cancer um, on a patient and their family, because there really are two aspects for treatment, at least as an oncologist. One is actually giving them the best chemotherapy, the best immunotherapy, the best monoclonal therapy, or the best targeted therapy. And the other part of chemotherapy or oncology care is really supportive care for the patient, how to care for the patient because patients have issues with depression, patients have issues with uh, families and transportation and kids and struggling with these things. And I think those are very important aspects to discuss also when discussing cancer care. So we're going to break it up into two parts. So this is a nice list and at the end of today's talk everyone has to take a quiz and score above an 80%. And we're going to ask these questions about the chemotherapy and their agents, so please pay attention. Um, the most common drugs for use chemotherapy I listed here are a drug called cisplatin, which is a platinum medication, which is a heavy metal, carboplatin, which is his cousin, docetaxel, gemcitabine, there's an nanoparticle called album, uh, pac, abraxane, paclitaxel, which is taxol, alimta for non squamous cell lung cancers, and venorobine. These are the classic drugs that we use for chemotherapy. And once again, we're going to discuss how we integrate these drugs with the newer drugs on the market. These are very effective drugs for some types of uh, lung cancer and really do help patients. Uh, even though there are newer drugs out there, these are very effective in some stages of diseases. So these are important to keep in mind. And for those who have or are family members with lung cancer, your oncologist likely we'll be discussing some aspects of these drugs in some form or another. I'm going to shift gears a little to the uh, biomarkers and testing for biomarkers. And before we get to the medications itself, a huge shift in paradigm for oncologists has been not only to test for lung cancer and these markers, 
but also I use in my practice frequently liquid genomics, which is really testing the blood and the DNA that's shed into the bloodstream to test for some of these biomarkers. But sometimes for some patients, it's impossible to get a biopsy or very difficult to get a biopsy. Yesterday, actually, I was seeing an 86-year-old gentleman who really didn't want a biopsy, and I told him, let's do liquid genomics and see you know, if we can get some biomarkers on you. If we get a targeted therapy, we don't need to do a biopsy, and we can pop you on a pill rather than go through all this stuff. That plan sort of backfired because the liquid genomics today are so unique that actually he ended up turning out to have, believe it or not, even though he had a mass in his lungs, he actually had a BRCA2 mutation, which was the most outstanding thing I've ever found in a lung cancer patient that I was working up. And I called the company and I asked them, why are you reporting this to me? He has lung cancer, A. B, now I have to deal with this. But it was so interesting because the patient then reported to me that his niece had breast cancer at age of 30, his brother had pancreatic cancer at 45, and his aunt died of breast cancer at, at 50. So the daughter in the room understood that she now has to get testing for breast cancer and BRCA gene mutations. So these liquid genomics that we have on the market, and there are various companies out there, there's something called Foundation Medicine, there's a company called Garden. We have about 1,000 kits in my office um, of different companies, and really they're quite effective and exquisite technologies today that we use for testing patients for specific types of cancers and mutational markers. And these are not just for lung cancer, of course, but I know this is a lung cancer lecture, but we use these uh, kits and the liquid genomics really to test for all types of markers. For instance, there's a marker called EGFR, which is epidermal growth factor receptor. There's approximately two or three drugs that are FDA approved right now on the market. One is called Tarceva, if everyone has heard of it. It's a drug that is taken orally. It causes rashes and diarrhea, but overall well tolerated. Has actually doubled the median survival of patients with breast cancer if you have EGFR receptor positive breast cancer. More recently, there was a study that was published of a competing drug called Tigresso, which was initially approved for T790M mutations and now has been compared as a head-to-head -head with Tarceva, and that drug in itself doubled the median survival over Tarceva alone. So as you can see, not only are we having market targeted, targeted therapy like EGFR receptor inhibitors given to our patients, we are also having drugs that are first-generation EGFR receptors, second-generation EGFR receptors, and they're improving upon the median survival of patients with breast cancer if you have this mutation. This mutation, incidentally, is very prominent in uh, Southeast Asia, and EGFR positivity in Southeast Asians is a very common or much more common type of uh, lung cancer. ALK gene rearrangement is a uh, newer kit on the block. There are various drugs that are FDA approved for ALK positive uh, lung cancer. <clears throat> this too has first, second, and third generation uh, uh, oral medications. And these, by the way, EGFR, ALK, ROS mutations um, all have oral agents. They're very easy to take for patients at home. They have very few side effects. They're very tolerable. I have, patient, I have a patient who has a ALK-like mutation who also, through liquid genomics, we, we got her mutation. She's been on this pill for three years. She started off on oxygen. She's well into her late 70s uh, and has been on it for three years and has no side effects and always asks me, when am I getting off the pill, Dr. Cohen? And I said, never, because it's working so well and has no side effects. And her disease on her scans, our PET scans and her CAT scans, is really not evident at this time. So these are truly targeted agents that work so exquisitely well for some patients. They don't work all the time for all patients, and they don't always work. There is actually loss of mutation or loss of ability to have an effect on these drugs. But overall, these medications are, have few side effects and maximal benefits for patients for long-term use. So cancer therapy works by interfering specific molecules involved in tumor growth and pro progression. And these are the drugs I was talking about, Ceramza, Tarceva, Afatinib, which is the Tarceva and the Erlatinib uh, are the same drug. Afatinib and Gil Giltorif is both EGFR receptors. Crizatinib and Zycada or Ceratinib are the ALK receptors. Tigresso is an EGFR receptor. Electinib is a 
ALK receptor and uh, Avastin, which I did not discuss. It's not related to EGFR, ALK, or ROS1. Actually, Avastin is a, is a vascular endothelial growth factor receptor that works in conjunction with chemotherapies. So there's an array of targeted therapies out on the market. In fact, some of these drugs work so exquisitely well that patients with brain metastasis, meaning cancer that has spread to the brain, which changes the prognosis and overall functionality of a patient, actually these medications can cross sometimes the blood-brain barrier, meaning go beyond the lungs into the, into the brain and actually treat the brain without some of the chemotherapies and radiation therapies that are available. So these are very promising medications that are only, only improve survival, improve quality of life for patients with lung cancer. So this slide is a little old, because you can see that it was in 2015, the first drug, uh, nivalumab or Optiva, was used for patients with non-metastatic squamous, non-small cell lung cancer who no longer respond after chemotherapy. So in 2015, we used to give ke patients our chemotherapy, and then after that, if they had recurrence or refractory disease, they were allowed to go on a uh, immunotherapy called Optiva. The second drug that was FDA approved in 2015 was uh, pemprozolimab. If, if you folks don't know these drugs, you can turn on your TV later today and that's all you'll hear about. It's almost like it's so exciting to have lung cancer because you can get Kytruda, but it isn't so exciting. But there is hope out there for patients with lung cancer. I think that should be the message. And this was uh, FDA approved in 2015 with patients with non-small lung cancer. Now, these were actually approved as second-line therapies, and there's a drug test that we used to do called PDL1, which is a stain to see how effective these medications will be for patients with lung cancer. So patients who are considered PDL1 positive, that means a stain of more than 50%, were thought to be patients who respond to these drugs, and those patients who are called PDL1 negative, i.e., the stain was 0%, were thought not to have any response to these drugs. That is not necessarily true. We know right now, first of all, the stain is not the best of stains. Number two, we know that patients who have pdl ones that are low or negative can still respond to these medications. So as of recently, actually, the FDA approved uh, Kytruda as frontline therapy with another combination of a drug called the Limta and Carboplatinum. Actually, as of last week, there was a study that added a Limta Carbo Kytruda to Avastin, which also improves survival. I'm not sure who's going to pay for all these medications because these are very expensive, but the truth is that these really improve survival and improve quality of life for patients. And after the chemotherapy portion is given, we usually go on what's called a maintenance therapy, meaning we continue on with the immunotherapies with, let's say, Olympta and Kytruda almost indefinitely, and there are patients that continue to respond and actually, despite the fact that they, they have initially as a stage four metastatic disease, can still be responding to their chemotherapy. I have patients now four years out, five years out, three years out, six years out on just Optivo therapy or Optivo uh, or Kytruda and Olympta therapy that are going years out now on these therapies with minimal side effects. I'm going to talk a little in a second about the side effects because no drug does not have side effects, but these are very effective drugs and pretty exciting in the field of oncology. In fact, this is not exclusive to lung cancer. This is really in all cancers. All the PDL1 or immunotherapy drugs are FDA approved in head and neck cancer, glioblastoma, bladder cancer, lung cancer, renal cell cancer, Hodgkin's disease. And, you know, in Hodgkin's disease and other types of, I'm not Hodgkin's, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, actually, the next line of, or permutation of a PDL1 or immunotherapy drug is called the CAR-T therapies that are being developed, which is a little more intricate and involved. But immunotherapies is really going to be the cutting edge of uh, therapy for a lot of cancers, but not all cancers. Um, it actually first was FDA approved PDL1 or the combination of a drug called nivalumab with a drug called Yervoy or ipilimumab was the first approved in melanoma, which has an immunogenic uh, response. So immunotherapies are the cutting edge. This is why you see so many commercials about it, but you also see so many commercials about it because it's a very expensive drugs and it's it's a very um, lucrative market for the pharmaceutical companies. Nonetheless, these drugs really work. 
the side effects of these drugs are the same way they work, they also affect your immune system. So patients can have thyroid issues related to it, pituitary issues related to it, or endocrine issues related to it. They can have inflammation of the lungs, which we call pneumonitis, inflammation of the kidneys called nephritis. They can have inflammation of the liver called hepatitis, and they can have inflammation of the colon called colitis. So there are patients that do take these medications that get into trouble, they do have side effects of these medications and you have to be, the patients have to be informed of when to tell their doctor of when these side effects are real. Patients get itching side effects or rashes related to it. So there are a lot of potential side effects from the immunotherapies, but all in all, if these therapies, some therapies that are working for patients are really golden for some of these patients. So it's a wonderful addition to armamentarium of our, our therapies. I'm going to talk for a minute about small cell lung cancer, and as Dr. Wynn pointed out, it's less or a smaller population that has small cell. <clears throat> small cell lung cancer is truly smoking-related as opposed to adenocarcinoma of the lungs, which, although it's lung cancer, I'm smoking-associated as well, there are patients that are non-smoking-related, especially there are studies in younger females that have non-small cell lung cancer that it's not smoking related But small cell is truly a smoker's disease. It represents, thank God, a smaller population, and typically they present as more advanced disease. And in my practice, things go in waves. I probably didn't see any small cells in six months, and this week I saw three small cell lung cancers. You know, they just come in waves and they come fast and furious, because if you do not treat these quickly, these grow very quickly and they can have very serious uh, implications, because patients can present very early with widespread disease, including brain metastases that need to be dealt with. So the treatment options in small cell lung cancer are limited and extensive stage, and that's how we typically break it up. As opposed to lung cancer, we call it stage one, two, three, and four. In small cell lung cancer, even though there is a stage one, two, three, and four, we typically as oncologists say, is it limited or extensive? And that's really based on the radiation field, meaning can it be encompassed by one radiation field or is it widespread, meaning in multiple areas? So if it's limited, typically patients get both chemo and radiation, what's called combined modality up front. Extensive stage uh, small cell lung cancer, typically patients just get chemotherapy. And a lot of times, while we hate to use this word, it's palliative in its sense, meaning we're not going to cure the patients with extensive small cell lung cancer, although um, we will discuss that in a second. I have a very interesting case. So, Surgery is not typically used for small lung cancer, although I have had cases throughout my career that a surgeon goes in there thinking it's non-small cell lung cancer, does a lung resection, either a partial, a wedge or a lobectomy, and it comes out as a stage one or a localized small cell lung cancer, leaving us with a predicament of what actually to do with those cases at that time. The chemotherapies are similar to the other chemotherapies I presented a minute ago for non-small cell lung cancer. They include drugs like cisplatin, carboplatin, etoposide, a topar isomerase inhibitor called irinotecan and topotecan. Other drugs that are used are gemcitabine, taxol, or paclitaxel, ifosma, and docetaxel. And radiation is typically used if it's a limited stage disease, meaning it's localized to one portal. Um, laser therapy uses a laser beam to kill the cells in radiation therapy, and it can be more pinpoint. So before I go on clinical trials, actually, the latest fold in, not, in small cell lung cancer is also immunotherapies. I actually have a young, jovial young guy. He walked into my office with a small cell lung cancer. He got chemo and radiation up front. About a year later, he actually literally was dragging his foot walking in my office. And I said, what's wrong with you? He said, I think I have the flu. I'm like, that's not how flu presents, not with dragging your feet. He had brain metastases. We actually treated his brain metastases now three years ago, and then I put him on a combination of immunotherapies, Optivo uh, and uh, Yervoy, Nivalumab and Yervoy. This is three years later. He is NED, meaning no evidence of disease. He actually is a spin teacher locally, so if anyone sees him working out at 5.30 in the morning like a madman, that's him, and he is he's doing great. And these are the immunotherapies. He had recurrence of his small cell now over three years ago, and he is in great shape, spinning every morning, 
working out every day and living life to its fullest. And he knows it. And he shows up with a smile every time to his immunotherapy. But basically, immunotherapies don't really cause nausea, vomiting, associated things like other chemotherapies that we all think of. It doesn't really cause hair loss. Doesn't cause, it can cause fatigue, but it doesn't cause a lot of the side effect that everyone associates with chemotherapy. So he just walks in, gets hooked up to my office for their, for their hour, an hour and a half, and then goes home and comes back his two or, he's actually on a four week schedule right now, comes back four weeks later, and that's it. I mean, that's his therapy for the rest of his life, but I could tell you that without these immunotherapies, his life wouldn't, A, he wouldn't be alive, and B, he wouldn't be experiencing such quality of life at this time. So that leads me to clinical trials, because the cornerstone of any uh, oncology is to actually look forward to the future in chemotherapy and what we have available and what we're working on right now. And clinical trials is the cornerstone of how we get to these immunotherapies. So they study promising new treatments. Every lung cancer treatment that we have today is based on clinical trials in the past. So all my patients will say, I'm not going, on, I'm not going to be a guinea pig. I, I don't want to be a guinea pig. But the truth is, is that uh, every, every clinical trial we have today is based on a uh, standard, uh, uh, every drug we have today is based on a clinical trial in the past. And these are based on three phases of the clinical trials. Phase one is an early phase. Phase three is a uh, later phase or randomized clinical trials. I know patients feel that they're guinea pigs. The truth is, I think this slide is a little long. In stage one, you are a guinea pig, meaning they're trying to figure out a dose. They don't really care if you respond. Stage two is they're trying to figure out if you respond. And stage three is they're thinking, is this better than the standard of care? And if it's better than the standard of care, then it becomes the standard of care, and that's how drugs get FDA approved. Not everyone is eligible for clinical trials, and it's complicated. And I always tell my patients, even though they're going, and I might send them for a clinical trial to another facility, um, I, will, I, always be, I will be their physician and help guide them in the clinical trials. But some clinical trials are real, and some are just you know, for the facility to enroll patients. But it's important to patients to know that clinical trials are available. Um, these are carefully conducted protocols. They are mandated by what's called the IRB, which is internal reviews, and uh, everyone has to have informed consent, meaning you have to know what you're getting involved in before you go on a clinical trial. Most clinical trials are limited, um, and everything has, is reported out. So when you go on a clinical trial, usually there's a nurse that's following you like a hawk for every side effect that's involved in a clinical trial. All clinical trials have to be FDA audited. Um, your doctor can halt your participation if you're not benefiting, meaning if you are doing poorly on the clinical trial, you should stop the medication. You shouldn't say, I'm doing it for mankind. There are other people that will do it for you. You can just move on to a different therapy. Um, just along the lines of clinical trials, for instance, and I'm going to keep on reflecting back to immunotherapies, Actually, the latest trend in immunotherapies is now to give immunotherapies, and there's an early what's called phase two clinical trial. It was just like 30 some odd patients presented about a few weeks ago at our American Society of Clinical Oncology meetings of giving patients a few doses of immunotherapy preoperatively and seeing how big the tumor was and what the response was. And the mar it was such a marked response to patients preoperatively. And I hate to put a surgeon out of business, but I'm happy to, and I'm sure my surgeon would be happy to have an easier tumor to resect than a larger tumor to resect, but you should see the response rates on this small subset. So this is going to be the next wave of future, is not using our immunotherapies after a patient has a large tumor. It's going to be using our immunotherapies to help the patients get smaller tumors to go on for surgical resections at that time. And that's how we're going to be using it. So we're going to talk about side effects. These are common side effects of chemotherapies and some immunotherapies. Fatigue is really the major one, and fatigue is multifactorial. It's going back and forth to the office. It's seeing the doctor. It's getting treatments that cause anemia, low, low hemoglobins, low white counts. It's trying to deal with life and still manage a, a disease process. There could be trouble breathing, Cl clearly in lung cancer, different than other cancers, you need your lungs to breathe, and your lungs are the greatest affected organ in this disease. 
you have pain, you can have nausea, vomiting, constipation, peripheral neuropathy, which means numbness and tingling in the fingertip. You can have low blood counts, infection issues, hair loss, skin changes, sexual and reproductive changes, which is hardly ever talked about and patients are embarrassed to talk about, but they're real, they're real side effects and they do need to be discussed. Anxiety and depression, which is probably overwhelmingly so common that I assume, by the way, every patient of mine has it unless they tell me they don't have it. And those things need to be addressed. So coping with the side effects, these side effects, and the reason why you meet back with your patients is actually to help report out to the patients. All my patients have my cell phone, which are texting me right now. And you should be reporting to your doctor uh, your side effects of your chemotherapy so they can be as informed and up to date to keep you, keep you out of the hospital and keep you moving forward in your therapy. Most side effects are treatable and manageable if addressed appropriately. Um, and stress and emotional impact of the cancer can be significant and can be managed. I, I always feel like this should be not only just an oncologist but a social worker or some else, someone else in your team helping the patients along because these are complex diseases with complex both physical and emotional aspects to it. So unfortunately, a lot of patients with lung cancer uh, have to deal with the aspect of what we call palliative care. Palliative care is not hospice. Um, it should be discussed throughout the treatment plan, meaning if you have a disease, um, we should know what the goals are of the disease and how, how to approach these goals and fulfill the goals. Um, the goal most of the time is not only to cure a patient, but it's also to improve your quality of life and extend your life. Um, it is appropriate at any point at any age to discuss your goals and where you're going with your disease process. Unfortunately, I mean, my, my favorite attending always used to say, no one gets out of here alive, meaning no matter what, things happen to us. We have to be honest with our patients and tell them when things aren't going well, when things aren't go even when things are going well, we should have our goals assessed. So living with cancer, and these are the universal challenges of cancer in every, in every patient, not just in lung cancer, but certainly in lung cancer patients. You have loss of hope, control, living with uncertainty. You have patients who actually feel alone and, and not having a support system around them. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of guilt, anger, blame, um, and emotional aspects of having cancer. Patients always feel like they're being a burden to their family because now someone else has to help them out and care for them. Someone else has to cook meals or help them out. And there really are a lot of resources out in this community. You know, the, uh, um, the cancer support community, which is sponsored through Monmouth Medical Center, has a facility for patients for other therapies and counseling. And I think it's very important to have not only a good oncologist helping support you through your cancer care, but also a good support team uh, surrounding you to help you with your emotional aspects of your cancer. Uh, distress can impact cognitive behavior and social and, and functioning. Um, you know, as a physician and someone who sees patients all day, we all recognize that patients are going through a stressful time. That's not, but patients have to ask for the help so we can get them the help that they need at the appropriate time to work with them. I mean, depression, anxiety, panic, these are all common side effects of just having a diagnosis, not only just dealing with uh, the chemotherapy aspect of things. Being positive is great. I always tell my patients, and I always believe my patients should exercise and walk. There was uh, two years ago, me and my partner, Dr. Sharon, who just ate dinner and left, um, <laughs> Uh, we're at a lecture at Yale, and we had all the world's leading experts talk about lung cancer. And then there was a gym teacher that came up there who ran a study that showed that <clears throat> 30 minutes of exercise a day could actually do more than a lot of our chemotherapies could ever do. It gets your blood pressure, your, your blood flowing, it gives you a better emotional support, it gives you a little direction. And she actually had these amazing statistics that showed that just doing exercise, 30 minutes a day, good intense walking, does a lot of uh, good for the patients. And even post-operatively, they show that patients who get up and have a good attitude and get, get going in life always will do better than patients who are bed-bound and unable to get up for various reasons. 
So it's important to express these emotions. Um, and we actually, as oncologists, really encourage our patients to talk and tell us um, what's going on. All my patients, fortunate for me or unfortunate for me, have my cell phone number. And after office hours, I'm always willing and able to uh, discuss with them or talk with them. Most of them like this to text um, me their, their emotional problems. <laughs> but that's OK, too. I think it's important to at least let someone know in your care team of what's going on with you. You should need a good support team, as I said. Clergies are good, trained mental uh, health professionals. Um, just having an outlet, some hobby, something else to get you out and off the mind of, because I, as a doctor, I don't view my patients as the lung cancer patient. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. They're, we're all people in our society and all contributing. Everyone should have a function, a goal, and other outlets and uh, other, other um, supports. So it's important to have good nutrition, um, exercise, sleep, hobbies are really important. Spiritual practices, if you're a spiritual person, connecting with others, getting out there. I mean, my patients always ask, could I go away? And I said, the whole point of this is for you to go away, meaning if you stay at home because you have cancer all the time, we're not really doing a good job here because the goal is not to live in a bubble. The goal is to get out of that bubble to live your life as best as you could. But you have to remember to uh, take care of yourself, talk to others, communicate with loved ones and health professionals. These are the resources that are important out there. The American Cancer Society is excellent. Locally is our cancer support community, which is excellent and should be utilized as much as possible. The NCI, National Cancer Institute, is a great website for clinical trials for those who want to go and look around for clinical trials. <clears throat> and this is a, I just want to bring this slide up. This is a new uh, uh, collaboration with the CMS that was rolled out with the VNA, which is Visiting Nurse Association, which is important. This is actually a free service that gets services out to the house. Um, it's basically uh, called Care Choices Model, and basically it's not, you're not enrolling in, in anything other than getting free services through the VNA. That's the way I look at it as an oncologist. Um, it provides uh, patient and family education. There's a case coordinator. Um, there's treatment options that are available. And really, they have other options available for the patient. So I think all patients who have Medicare, I think it's just for Medicare patients, could enroll in this as a service for their patients. So I'm going to stop here. And I appreciate all your time. And